that's doing. There we go. We are doing well. Welcome, 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 welcome. Yes, apparently we are live. Welcome to Westin Ha. Oh, okay. I am hearing my song. That is uh, not the most. The most. Hello, welcome. Okay, wonderful. Welcome to Westin Ha, a contemporary arts institution in the Hague, the Netherlands, where we are hosting presenting a year-long project dedicated to the life and work of American actor, musician, intellectual and political militant, Paul Robeson. This is the second event in our public program, and I am your host, curator of the exhibition and the public program, Robert Robert, and I am pleased and honored to welcome and introduce today Dr. Barbara Ransby. Dr. Ransby is the John D. MacArthur Chair and Distinguished Professor in the Departments of Black Studies, Gender and Women's Studies, and History at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She's also Editor-in-Chief of Souls, a critical journal of Black politics, culture, and society, and is a member of the editorial working group at the London-based journal Race and Class, and the editorial advisory board of the Justice, Politics, and Power book series at the University of North Carolina Press. Welcome, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. Very happy to have you here. Dr. Ramsey is also uh, author of the what might be considered the canonic biography of uh, Paul Robeson's wife and partner in so many uh, aspects of his life, uh, Eslanda Good Robeson. The title of the book is Eslanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson. Let's uh, start uh, our conversation today with uh, maybe, a, maybe a general introduction. Who was uh, Eslanda Good Robeson, and uh, how did she come into your life? Well, first of all, it's it's wonderful that this year long um, tribute to Paul Robeson is is happening. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of it. Some of the other folks who will be participating are people who are colleagues and comrades um, for many years. So it's it's great to include Eslanda in in that story as well because she was such a central part of it. So my interest in Eslanda Robeson began um, when I was an undergraduate in New York, and I was actually doing research at the Schomburg Center uh, in Harlem on another, on a pretty obscure Nigerian politician, uh, research for, for, for a faculty member. And to distract myself from what I was supposed to be doing, I, I began to, to snoop around in some of the other files and some of the other archives that were there at the Schomburg and discovered a small Robeson collection uh, which had included both Paul and Eslanda's uh, writings and documents and so forth. So I spent some time uh, looking at, you know, her life, a little glimpse into her life, and I became curious. I wrote an article as an undergraduate many, many, many years ago um, called uh, Eslanda Robeson, Eslanda Good Robeson Pan-Africanist. And that was it, you know, it was 1986, and I just left it. And so uh, I kept her on my mind. I thought about what an interesting woman, so many questions. Um, and of course, like most people, I, my first interest in Islanda came through Paul. Um, you know, he was a great hero uh, to black radicals in the United States. Um, you, in my introduction, you gave my academic introduction, but I'm also an activist. I was a part of the Black Radical Congress and African-American women in defense of ourselves and the Free South Africa movement. So um, so I bring to my academic work a set of political commitments as well. And so my intellectual curiosities are also guided by those commitments. Uh, Paul Robeson was someone I'd always known about um, as, as long as I knew anything about Black history, African-American history. But Aslanda was someone I knew very little about. So my curiosities lingered. And many years later, after I wrote the book on Ella Baker, had done some other things, I was searching for another book project. 
And I thought to myself, I wonder who's written a, a biography of Aslanda because certainly uh, a life that interesting had not been, um, you know, had not gone without a biography all those years. And I didn't find one. So I decided to write one. And um, that's, that's sort of my personal journey to Aslanda's life story. But there's a number of reasons that her life is significant. Um, of course, she is most known for her relationship to Paul, but um, she represented really an internationalist voice, uh, a early black feminist voice, even though she wouldn't have embraced that label per se, stood up to uh, Joe McCarthy in the Cold War House on American Activities Committee, traveled around the world with Paul uh, to, you know, both in terms of his career, but also in terms of their own political commitments and traveled quite a bit without Paul. In fact, her, her three major trips to the African continent were without, uh, without her husband. She uh, was an anthropologist and a writer. She was a serious intellectual, um, a devoted anti-colonialist and pan-Africanist and anti-fascist, traveled with Paul to the front lines of the Spanish Civil War, uh, went to China only two months after the revolution in 1949. So, you know, it was just a, a, almost a seductive life story um, that I wanted to know more about. And so, um, so I began to research and, and, and write about her. And there's archives all over the world. There's an archive, of course, in Berlin, um, in New York, at uh, the Moreland Spingarn in, in Washington, D.C., at Howard University, where the bulk of the papers um, exist. So that's kind of my entree to her life. And, you know, she just, I, I mentioned just a few bullet points of her career. But of course, she was also a, a correspondent at the United Nations. She was there at the founding of the United Nations in 1945. So my goodness, the whole sweep of 20th century history, uh, Aslanda Robeson was there in some way. Um, and so I wanted to tell the story of this pretty amazing radical black woman um, and to also kind of rescue her from Paul's shadows, if you will. And how has the how has the journey been since the the book has come out? Uh, what kinds of reactions have we gotten? Uh, yeah, well, you know, the journey has been interesting, and a, and a book always has different uh, chapters in a sense, right? The chapters in the book, but the the life of the book itself. So um, many people were surprised to know that Paul Robeson had such an independent, strong, accomplished, committed uh, wife and comrade. Many people just did not know. So, um, so that was that was one kind of reaction. Uh, another reaction was uh, people who knew people who intersected with her life, right? Because she not only traveled the world, but she was friends with Zora Neale Hurston. She uh, knew Emma Goldman. All these various uh, characters in history, you know, artistic, literary, and political, um, floated through her life or had serious long-term relationships. Uh, friendships with, with her and not, not all filtered through Paul. Um, so people who also had connections to those individuals and organizations they were part of um, have responded to, to, to the biography over the years. So it came out in 2013 and I'm so happy that Haymarket Books has reissued it uh, because I, I think it didn't um, get the kind of attention and circulation that it deserved. It spent many years researching that book and that interesting life. And so um, I'm really happy that it's, it has a new shelf life uh, with the Haymarket uh, edition. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. You find that it's being included in uh, various curricula? Uh, oh yeah, it's being included in curricula and also you know, in the movement spaces that I'm in, people are very interested, you know, what does black internationalism look like? You know, there's the official story of, of black diplomats who go on behalf of <laughs> empire. Uh, but, but to, you know, sort of grassroots internationalism, people to people internationalism, um, Black women who, who were engaged in the world. And, you know, she was, she was very much an anti-colonialist and very, very committed to Pan-Africanism and African uh, independence in that era. But she was interested in the world. Um, she, she traveled around the world um, speaking out against capitalism, against racism, against... Um, colonialism and war. So, um, so to have that as a part of our archive, as a part of our 
um, chronology of, of world left history as well as uh, African-American history is important. She, I often say, you know, she left the United States. Uh, she thought of herself as a Negro, which is how most black people referred to themselves at that time. Um, and then after living in London for a number of years and, and time in Paris and traveling to the African continent, she came back as a, as a black woman and an internationalist uh, as, she, as she described herself. So, um, so just a, a fascinating life journey um, in turbulent times and in the context of some pretty amazing social movements and, and world events. Let's uh, speak a little bit more about the mechanics of the biography. You managed to evoke Islanda as a full, multi-dimensional woman with, besides her brilliance, audacity, and courage, her desires, needs, fears, and doubts. How did you work out the balance in that portrayal? What were the, what were the feminist and mm -hmm. anti-racist considerations? Yeah. Well, it's always interesting to tell someone else's story. So it was the second biography that I wrote. The first biography was, of course, the biography of uh, Ella Baker, who was involved in the Black freedom movement for 50 some years. And it took me a very long time to write that book because I was trying to strike precisely the balance that you, uh, that you described. But the two subjects were very, very different. Um, and the archive was very, very different. Uh, Ella Baker didn't leave much of a personal archive and I had to piece it together. And I often say that Aslanda kind of left, you know, crumbs in the snow. I mean, she really curated her own life archive. So I had diaries, I had letters. Um, I had a number of things to give me a sense of her interior world, or at least what she wanted a biography to know, a biographer to know about that interior world. So I had to also be a little bit um, of a skeptic. But the reason, you know, biography appeals to me and the reason that her life story appeals to me is ways that we can show how ordinary people, and she was, she was ordinary and extraordinary at the same time, but, but the way in which people who, you know, live what we might consider normal lives with desires, frustrations, fears, anxieties, um, you know, complicated marriages, and still manage to be historical actors and, and manage to engage in work that is world changing and world making. So in talking about her, her personal life, the people she liked and didn't like, all of the ups and downs in her marriage, her difficulty with motherhood, um, all of that kind of tries to portray her as a, as a full body woman who um, navigated a world that was in some ways not ready for a black woman like her but, uh, but she did nevertheless, and she didn't do it without making mistakes um, or, or without regrets. So um, I think all of that is part of, you know, telling a truer, giving a truer picture of history and historical actors. And, we, you know, we put people on pedestals. This person was a great, you know, person and they sort of superhuman, but, you know, human beings who make their mark in history also are human beings. And so that's what you know, I, I attempt to, to do in, in that. And the diaries were a great help and insight. And some things in the diary, uh, everything in the diary wasn't actually factually accurate, I came to learn. So, um, so that was also sobering and humbling, like it's written on paper, but it ain't always true. So, um, so yeah, so it was, uh, it was always a negotiation about what to tell and and you know, a biography is not a life transcript. So you have to decide what's important and what's not. And I was really, to be honest, I was concerned and interested in her political voice um, first and foremost, but I had, to, I had to talk about the full person um, at the same time. Yeah, wonderful. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge to, I mean, it, it, you, you can tell the difference so. Um, with, with, for example, the uh, uh, Gerald Horne's uh, biography of Paul, Paul Wilson, which uh, is much more concerned with events and much has a much stronger, like, much, like, much more, uh, maybe more abstract, but more direct uh, political thrust. Mm. Um, well, I mean, you know, I, I think, I think that 
Aslan book has a political thrust as well, but I but the other um, challenge is when you write a biography of someone who people don't know a lot about. <laughs> Um, it's a different kind of challenge. I have to actually explain her to the world. I think in some ways, at least through a limited lens, you know, uh, Paul Robeson has been written about, has been profiled. People, people at least know the snapshot version of Paul Robeson. And so Gerald then had the ability to work against that narrative to tell a fuller story, a more radical story. Um, but the basics were out there. But if the basics aren't out there, you, you have to share that too to make the person you know, known and legible. Right, and uh, it, it was really, like Paul, Paul was really a team project uh, through, through his whole life and through Eslanda's whole life. Uh, she was key to him becoming who he became. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the early career, I mean, I say at one point in the book, I think she was really the architect of his early artistic career. I mean, the man was amazingly talented, um, amazingly driven, amazingly principled in many ways, although perhaps not the best husband to uh, his wife all the time. But um, so, uh, but, but, but she did some of the necessary work to launch that early career, including bolstering his confidence. Um, he, he, of course, had been an athlete and a lawyer uh, and was, was, not satisfied with those paths, but but Aslanda gave him tips on his performance, you know, helped him present himself to the world in a certain way. She was his publicist, his manager, his life coach. Um, she was so many things that enabled him to go out on the world stage in the way that he did. And I don't want to minimize her role. I mean, she wasn't just a, a caretaker. Uh, she was also someone that helped to shape that role and had a very important political influence on him as well. I mean, I think they they were very much peers, even though many people don't see them that way. And she certainly isn't generally written about as a peer. She wasn't as famous as him, but she was as committed and as smart as him. Yeah, I think that comes across in the biography that uh, they, that their shared, and their shared political commitments also evol evolved together. Uh, yes at the same time and, and they they were each other's intellectual foil uh, or at least a trustworthy foil that they, they could uh, experiment with ideas with each other yes yes no uh, absolutely and when she um you know she goes to the london school of economics and uh meets a number first of all she you know her her intellectual growth you know kind of takes off, not because of what she's being taught, but in some ways she's provoked to do her own research and reading and discussion by things she hears in class that she doesn't always agree with, but she meets an amazing um, cohort of, of people uh, while she's in London. And she introduces Paul to Jomo Kenyatta, for example, who becomes of course, you know, uh, leader of independent Kenya and all of that. But uh, she, um, you know, she debates Paul and she pushes back and she uh, introduces him to new ideas and books and uh, literature and, and vice versa. So um, it, it, I think it was a relationship of, of peers. Uh, someone said to me once, I won't say who, Paul Robeson had no peers and I, and I, I beg to differ. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very interesting relationship. And, you know, back to the personal for a minute, I think in some ways, you know, they had this sort of open marriage, more open for him than for her, but, um, and it was difficult and it caused her a lot of personal pain at different times. But I think the political and intellectual relationship really took center stage, especially in their later lives. And that defined their partnership. I mean, they had a son in common whom they loved uh, and, and a, you know, growing circle of friends who they considered family. But uh, it was that, that shared political vision and values and, um, and the intellectual rapport that they had that really was, was, was a bond more than sort of traditional romantic notions of partnership. 
But you mentioned that uh, uh, that Islanda was alone at pivotal moments in her life. She was. Uh, how did um, how did she manage? And uh, in the end, it was as you just said, like it was in, in a sense that they they were able to come together through their shared political commitments and and mm -hmm. and the community around them. Mm -hmm. Well, when, when their son was born, she was alone and it was a difficult birth. Uh, there was another time where she had a health issue and Paul was traveling. And she sort of understood that um, having a husband and a partner who was going to be on the world stage initially as an artist, I mean, always as an artist, really. Um, and, and, you know, the political commitments were global. But what really took him to many places around the world was was his was his artistry and his his um, artistic talents and performances and so forth that that was a part of the price that she had to pay um, and I think there was a, you know a sense of loss at times that she wanted uh, Paul to be more present in her life now later in life he becomes ill and she is navigating his health care and. Uh, trying to get him the best treatment and all this kind of thing. So she does become a kind of caretaker and I think neglecting her own health in some, in some way. So that was difficult, but they did have um, the support of her mother for as long as she lived, who was an interesting character who became the, the caretaker for their son while Eslanda traveled, but, um, but also a wide circle of friends whom she confided in, relied on, uh, ate and drank with. Uh, so, um, so there was that support and that supplement to what was sometimes missing in the marriage. Islanda, the picture you give of Islanda in the, in, in, especially in Europe, uh, is one who is at ease moving in various circles, meeting people from from the highest level of the British nobility to the students and to, to workers. Um, can you give us a little uh, insight about how she was able to, to, to move between all these, all these different uh, circles with such ease and be accepted, as, especially uh, as, a, as, a, as a peer? Yeah, I'm not sure she was always accepted as a peer. I think she, mm. she presented herself as if you know, she was a peer and expected that treatment. Uh, there were times where she entered a room and people wanted to know, where's, where's your husband? Uh, they, they really expected the two of them to be there and she walked in on her own. But she was a woman of enormous confidence. I think her mother instilled that um, in her and she... Um, you know, she, she took that confidence with her all over the world. I mean, she did speak French. She spoke a little uh, Russian. She, uh, Paul was, you know, somebody who, who had a great proficiency for language, as, as you know. And Aslanda, less so, but, but more than most people. And she, was, she had this curiosity about people and she did her homework in most cases. And uh, I think there was an openness and a... I don't know, a sort of vitality about her, not just as a party person, but as a, um, you know, a person really with an insatiable curiosity about what was going on in the world and not afraid to speak her mind. And that drew people to her. So yeah, she spent some time in Paris. She had a, uh, a friend, Kojo uh, Tuvalu Hoinu, who was a Dahomeyan, um, claimed to be a Dahomeyan prince, but that was disputed by some. He was kind of an eccentric character. And he introduced her to artists, literary figures, um, people from the diaspora, from, from Martinique and Guyana and uh, from the continent of Africa, of course. And she was really enthralled and really was so curious about what was going on in, in the Caribbean and in Africa and other parts of the world that this drew her into that circle in a really powerful way and propelled her to want to travel even more. Um, she, I mentioned Guyana. Of course, she, she also went to uh, Guyana and was peripherally involved in, in Caribbean um, independence politics, was very good friends with Chetty Jagan and his wife, uh, Janet Jagan, who were, of course, uh, leftist leaders in, in the Guyanese movement and, and 
the leader of the of the of the country at one point. So um, so yeah, she was she was just an, an extraordinary person, and I think uh, I think it would be un, dishonest to not talk about her privilege in some ways because sometimes she traveled around the world first class. Um, and she traveled as a light-skinned Black woman who was sometimes racially ambiguous. Uh, but always when she opened her mouth, she identified herself as a, as a, a Black woman, as an African-American, as a Negro, uh, so that there was no uh, uncertainty or doubt about that. She never tried to pass for white. But, but she was able to travel in a more privileged circumstance as the wife of uh, a well-known artist and also as a person who for a good part of her life, uh, adult life, did have financial resources. The thing about that too, of course, is that even though Paul and Aslanda had money part of their adult lives, that was not paramount. And by speaking out in support of the Soviet Union, speaking out in support of African independence, criticizing the US government, um, of course, they at one point lose their passports, both of them, and Paul is not able to work. He's blacklisted. They're called before the House on American Activities Committee. She is. Um, and he goes before the Senate committee. And they're, they're willing to risk that privilege for the sake of politics and principle. And that, that's, that's pretty admirable. Mm -hmm. and yes, you mentioned that, that uh, Islanda comes from relative privilege in black society uh, over time in America. And, uh, she, she had, she had a, she was from an early age also uh, had a sense of, of, one might say burgeoning, again, you wouldn't call it that, but feminist or anti-racist justice uh, from early on, but, uh, but that matured significantly and, and Developed significantly and, and became much more, uh, much more serious as, and much more central to her life as as her, uh, as as her life went on. But what were this? What were the important or pivotal moments that that really brought her about to to really commit herself to 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 her to her politics? Mm -hmm. Well, as you mentioned, she she came from a political family. So her grandfather, Francis Cardozo, was a Reconstruction era politician that, that um, what W.B. Du Bois called the brief experiment in interracial democracy, where um, after the end of the Civil War, some Black people were able to hold office and so forth. And her grandfather was one of them uh, in South Carolina and then moved to D.C. and became an educator. Her mother was always a bit of a rebel. Uh, and in uh, the 1920s in Harlem, she uh, connected to something called the Liberty League, led by the socialist, Black socialist, Hubert Harrison. And this was all a part of, of Islanda's family life, and her, her, her worldview was, I think, uh, influenced early on. But at the same time, there was a kind of bourgeois ambition, if you will. Uh, she liked nice things. She liked attention. Um, and all of that. So, you know, in, a, in other words, this is what the complications and contradictions of human beings. But then there were critical moments, um, you know, in her life. I think certainly going to London, uh, being in London in those international circles, just uh, you know, to, to use a term we used to use, kind of blew her mind. And uh, she's writing different kinds of things in her journal. Um, so, so that exposure was really important. And then I think her, she had a kind of crisis in her marriage in the early 1930s, in which it looked as though she and Paul were going to divorce. And I think she really had uh, had to look in the mirror and decide who do you want to be in the world, what do you want to, what mark do you want to make in the world, other than supporting uh, and 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 managing Paul's career. And so that was a turning point for her when she decided she wanted to pursue anthropology and journalism. She wanted to travel on her own. Um, so those those were those were personal variables. And then of course the world is on fire. I mean, she travels to Africa for the first time in 1936, um, soon after Italy had invaded Ethiopia and um, you know, fascism was, was on the rise. 
So she travels to the Soviet Union during World War II and she and Paul both stop in Berlin where they get a glimpse uh, of, of the Nazis. You know, they're, they're Nazi soldiers on the, on the train platform. So she, she sees these world events unfolding um, around her and she is taking it all in and taking it seriously and really um, growing her own intentions and commitments about how she wants to impact that world. So I think those are, are some things, um, you know, they're not moments, they're more phases of her life that, that were so key. So when, when Wilson came back, uh, you, you mentioned that she came back as a, as a black intellectual, she came back as a, as a, as a committed activist. And she also came to be, and as, as a result of that, she, uh, she was confident and outspoken and uh, she came to uh, merit the attentions of the FBI at home. And, um, and knew that she was under surveillance and uh, how was she able to how was she able to remain so resolute uh, during this time and despite the, the threat of persecution? Mm -hmm. Well, I think she was she was tough and stubborn, um, and that was just a part of her. That was a that was an apolitical part of her personality that got politicized, right? So, um, I'm not going to let anyone push me around was her idea. I'm not going to let anyone silence me. Um, so that was kind of a part of who she was, independent of the specifics, right? But then I think she was she was she was committed, and she understood that the stakes were high, and she was not going to name names. She was not going to um, capitulate to the intimidation that uh, the FBI and and um, you know the the interrogation by you know really Joe McCarthy and, and who was notorious uh, anti communist in that period you know, subjected her to. And she was actually brought before the House Un-American Activities Committee, ostensibly not because of Paul, but because of her book, her book, um, uh, African Journey, in which she talked about her travels through the African continent and meeting with independence leaders. She met with uh, future leaders of the African National Congress in South Africa and so forth, and, and talked about the right of Africans to, to determine their own future and to, to run their, their own country. And this was seen as a part of her seditious behavior, uh, in addition to, of course, um, communist sympathies. And she and Paul both said they weren't members of the Communist Party, but of course they were very, very close to the Communist Party and, uh, and to the communist movement in the world. But she was, she was a, a courageous and defiant person. And when she settled on her political beliefs and her worldview, she was determined, courageous, and defiant in uh, espousing and defending that, that position. I mean, she did not make a political speech to them per se. You know, she did not make the case for socialism in front of HUAC, but she defended her right to, to write and to believe what she believed. Now, uh, there's one scene in that, um, the HUAC interaction where she's, she's actually asked, did you write this book yourself? Um, and that really set her off because it was so condescending and, and uh, uh, disrespectful. So yeah, she, she was she was quite the character. I mean, there were scenes when she they at one point when they moved back to the United States after living in London for a while, they moved back in 1939. And Paul was uh, spending a lot of time in New York City uh, working, and she was at the home that they had in New Jersey, in Connecticut. Sorry. And she, uh, she was there alone and she was sometimes under surveillance. And so uh, she, you know, held her own, let's just say. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, an exciting time. I mean, it was, it was wartime in the States, but uh, the, yeah, communism was popular. Uh, maybe the most popular it has ever been and maybe I don't know, but uh, until historically at, at, at its high point um, and uh, the intellectual atmosphere in Harlem, for example, was 
will probably also at a at a at its most intense. Maybe maybe not. It's, that that may, might have continued after the after the war, but it was a very very stimulating period. Yeah, absolutely. And when we when we read back on um, Paul and Islanda's political sympathies in that period, it's important to know, you know, Langston Hughes and a whole number of people were either uh, sympathetic to, affiliated with, or a part of communist and socialist organizations and movements. People traveled to the Soviet Union uh, to see what that experiment looked like. And, and of course, in the wake of the Great Depression here, uh, capitalism was, was on trial in many people's minds. It had failed working people so miserably and continues to do so. Um, so there was a curiosity about the socialist uh, experiment in the Soviet Union. And, you know, uh, we, we see where it has where it is where it has turned. But to think back to the 1930s, um, it was a very different and a hopeful period. Uh, also, African Journey uh, was was her first big success as a writer, uh, as you could say, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, she became known as an expert on Africa in in the States. How, how did that work? Well, when the book was published, um, well, first of all, she had, she was also a, a correspondent and she had written articles and so forth. And then she, you know, she published the book uh, and then she did a book tour and she went around uh, talking about the tour. She had this network of, you know, scholarly and literary friends. Shirley Graham Du Bois, of course, was one of her friends who was also a writer and the wife of W.B. Du Bois. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston was a, a friend. So she had friends who were writers and um, scholars that helped her to network, to share the book. But she, she went around and, and spoke about the book as a part of speaking about the need for African independence, um, speaking against US uh, you know, neo-colonialism and so forth. And so um, you know, that, was a, that was a great experience for her because she was also doing that on her own. She, she had written a book about Paul, Paul Robeson Negro, uh, which of course still tethered her to Paul's story. But this was about a journey she had taken on her own um, on a political platform that she was uh, using to, to talk about her ideas and her experiences. So it was, it was a very important period in her life. And she met people along the way through the book um, that became a part of her life and her political and intellectual uh, community. She also helped to found along with Paul, the Council on African Affairs, uh, around this time, and Paul and Max Jurgen, Max Jurgen, who she had met in South Africa, who later becomes a conservative, but at that time he was not; he was on the right side of history. Uh, but um, so her, so her, her book writing and her um, book talks were also linked to a practice uh, of, of advocacy and building ties and networks with uh, people in the diaspora who were supporting African liberation struggles. Was she, did she, uh, I know she uh, ended up becoming more in demand as a writer, right? And uh, as a correspondent on, on African affairs. Did that have something to do with, with her involvement in the nascent uh, United Nations? Uh, yeah, I think that was, that certainly enhanced her profile. I, you know, she, I don't want to overstate the case though. You know, she never, in some ways, as I look back on her, she should have been more recognized and, and uh, uh, sought after as a speaker and writer and, and strategist at the time than she was. I mean, she did have her moment of sharing her work of being in demand, uh, but certainly never, you know, on the scale that, that Paul was or that many of her contemporaries were. So, um, so yeah, I mean, she she gave book talks and 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 people read and cited the book, and she was um, lecturer in a number of uh, places around the country and in other parts of the world. And she, uh, you know, she used that platform, but she she her career never took off as a writer and a scholar in the way that I think at one time she had hoped that it would. And it wasn't just. Uh... 
um, as a scholar and a writer and a political activist and involved in the CAA and uh, these, these uh, militant organizations. She was also hosting people at her home, uh, taking people in uh, with actually active on, on, at the base of social reproduction. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. She, um, I, one of the, the instances you may be referring to is she had this very interesting relationship with Jawaharlal Nehru and his sister, um, Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit. And they were, of course, fighting the British <laughs> in India for Indian independence and, and uh, various periods in prison and so forth. And at one point, um, Pandit's Pandit, who becomes also a very prominent female figure in the United Nations, becomes a close personal friend of Aslanda. They met in London and kept in touch and corresponded. And, and Aslanda also corresponded with Nehru himself and had a friendship with him. But when Pandit was in jail in India, her daughters were in the United States in college and Aslanda essentially adopted them and, and took them into her home on weekends and so forth. And they called her their you know, American mother. Uh, so, she, so that was a gesture of solidarity and yes, social reproductive labor, uh, <laughs> but it was also political labor in that, you know, she was doing that as a gesture of support uh, for Pandit and for Nehru uh, at that time. A lot of people floated through her home. And, you know, I mean, there's a way in which we can trivialize that as she was kind of a political socialite or something like that. But really, I mean, I've known many people like this, the, the dinner table, bringing people to your home and to your dinner table to eat is also about building trust and community and solidarity. And we open up to each other about what we believe and what we want to do in the world, you know, while we're breaking bread together. So she understood that very much and, and hosted and convened many gatherings that brought people together who otherwise would not have been in the same room. Um, and we can only imagine you know, that some collaborations emerged from that. Uh, give us a sense of, uh, her, of Islanda as a, as a I don't know if we call it established or maybe a mature writer and commentator once she's she's already uh, she's already started battling serious health uh, problems and she's uh, has a lot of and she's writing much much more and much more confidently uh, as she gets into the 1960s. She is indeed, and she is um, observing and rooting for the black liberation movement here as it becomes more radical and more militant. And she does not bite her tongue. She frames it in an international context, but um, she's, you know, she's very interested in uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the, um, she, she, she dies right before the Black Panthers really take off. She's interested in Malcolm X and she's interested in the urban rebellions that are occurring really right on the, Eve of her own demise, um, sadly, but she's she's writing and she's um, making connections between those uprisings and anti-colonial uprisings, you know, in other parts of the world. She writes about, uh, for example, the Sharpeville massacre in South Africa in 1961. Um, you know, she she writes about uh, urban uprisings in the United States. Uh, she meets Martin Luther King in London ever so briefly. At one point, there's a photograph of the two of them. She is without Paul at that time. So she's, she's seeking out people even when she's in London. You know, they, they live in London in the 1930s and then they go back uh, for, for a period of time um, after their passports are returned. So it's in that period that she, she meets with Dr. King in London. So yeah, just becoming a very a confident writer, an unapologetic writer, um, a writer that has this breadth of experience under her belt um, at that point. And so um, not trying to prove anything to anyone and also feeling her own mortality. You know, we, as we get older and, and as people have health challenges, you start to think, I better say what I want to say now because, you know, I won't always be able to. So I think there was some of that as well in her uh, kind of trenchant um, 
sharp edged commentaries. Who is reading her at that time? Who is her readership? Um, it's hard to tell, but you know, she published in a number of forums. She uh, published in Freedom Ways, and which Paul helped to found, and Lorraine Hansberry, of course, worked on it. She published a little bit in that. She published in various uh, left-wing journals. She published internationally in a journal in the Soviet Union. Uh, some of her uh, publications made their way to Southern Africa. So I think it was not a mass audience for sure. Uh, there were a couple of newspaper um, articles as well, you know, like mainstream newspaper articles. But I think there was a growing um, left audience and readership that, you know, sought her work out and to whom she was speaking in many ways. Uh, so, so that's who I think her, her readership was. I mean, there was, she was one of the premier voices for like introducing uh, issues related to African sovereignty and Pan-Africanism to American uh, Black readership, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And in Black publications, you know, Black newspapers and so forth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and on the speaking circuit. You say that she never identified as feminist, but retrospectively could be described as a Black left feminist and part of the Black women's intellectual and political history. I just quoted that from, from the book. Yes. Uh, please tell us about uh, that tradition and how she fits in. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a number of ways. First of all, she does write about women's issues, and she writes about women in the independence movement uh, in Africa and, and in Asia. She also cultivates and curates a set of relationships with uh, women uh, left political actors around the world. Um, she travels to Ghana in 1957, uh, 1958, 1958. Uh, and she meets with this group of women from, you know, India, Egypt, uh, you know, the African continent, various countries in the African continent and, and the Caribbean. And she, um, you know, they talk about what, is there a world revolution and what is the role of women in it? So very conscious based on her own life experiences and sensibilities um, about women's role, about women's voice um, and about gender inequality and how that had to be addressed. And she was very inspired by some of the women she met um, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular during her travels, as well as the, the folks that she had met in Paris. Many of them were you know, very strong, independent, brilliant uh, women. So, you know, this was, this was a part of her political worldview was one that addressed and um, uh, grappled with issues of gender inequality. And of course that manifested in her own life in which people didn't take her as seriously, you know, she was Paul Robeson's wife and so forth and so on. And so she had to fight for her own um, voice and platform. So she understood it on that level. But she also understood um, the drudgery of working class women who, who had reproductive labor at home, domestic work at home and um, you know, work in, in, in the wage labor force. Uh, she understood sexual violence in the world. She had talked to women who had experienced that in times of war. And, um, you know, she was, she was very clear about that. So, you know, she, she met with and spoke on the platform with um, uh, Amy Jacques Garvey and Shirley Graham Du Bois and Claudia Jones, who was a famous uh, black communist leader in London, a black women's forum. And there's a wonderful picture of her, her there, a wonderful photograph. Uh, so she spoke on forums in which the issue of women's liberation, women's future, women's rights was very much um, at the center. It wasn't the same lexicon that we use, the same vernacular that we might use today, uh, but very similar sentiments, um, you know, grounded in that period. Yeah, there's, I wonder maybe you can speak to this, that uh, at that time there was, uh, well, it wasn't, wasn't exclusive uh, to 
it, there, there wasn't only this kind of fem feminist or women's uh, uh, political activism, which was which had a, had an intersectionality whereby the concern was uh, also the, or the the understanding was that the the destiny of working women and women in uh, what we call today the global south was key to bringing about the changes that women would want to see in in uh, in the global north right that at that time uh, that was much more tied up with a vision of of uh, economic transformation or economic justice uh, than it seems to be today I'm not sure. If it's well, the this it, it's never a monolithic movement. So right. I consider myself a Black left feminist. Um, and both the connection to Black liberation, and the connection to left traditions are part of that identification. Um, and so there's there's always contestation. It's not just, you know, we, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, but I, I think she certainly was someone who was not reductionist uh, uh, or, or one-dimensional in terms of her understanding of issues of women's liberation. That was embedded in her Pan-Africanism, embedded in her anti-capitalist politics and her class politics. So um, she has an exchange with Pearl Buck, where they, they actually co-author uh, a book together, American Argument, <laughs> and, it, and they argue the <laughs> book. And one of the things is, you know, it's just about women's condition. And she uh, rightfully argues for an expansive intersectional approach to women's liberation and gender justice, which has to be bound up with uh, the economic needs, the uh, uh, anti-racist desires, uh, the anti-colonial aspirations of women, uh, particularly women in the global South and particularly women of color in, in, in the North. So she, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, intersectionality had a practice before it had a name. And so in a sense, she was a part of that practice tradition uh, of linking issues together in the context, but, but, but gender inequality was one of those issues. And I'm, I'm using a, a kind of shorthand, I would maybe say it a little bit different. It's not simply gender inequality, but uh, a feminist vision uh, that transcends heteropatriarchy. Now that was not her language. That's my language, but um, but but it, it's consistent with where her ideas were headed. Great. Well, um, I'd like to hear about your yourself and the, your. Uh, your vision of uh, confronting hetero patriarchy <laughs> today, and what are the urgent, what are the urgent uh, key issues uh, that, as you see them to confront both where you are in the states today, uh, taking mm -hmm. uh, account of what has been accomplished so far and what is uh, still to be done mm -hmm. internationally. So much. I, I, I wish I could give you three bullet points to <laughs> here's here's what we need to do. Yeah. You know, it's a complicated and scary world. I mean, the the, the this newly elected uh, right wing fascist in Italy, you know, the, the growth of uh, right wing authoritarianism around the world from, you know, Duterte to Bolsonaro, et cetera. You know, that's the landscape that we're in. Um, the existential climate crisis, which is so tied to capitalist economic practices, right? Um, and I think a, a certain kind of misogyny in our culture that uh, is, is quite prevalent and, and a resistance to, um, you know, LGBTQ rights. Now we might say that those have progressed so tremendously, the fact that we even articulated in that way since Eslanda Robson's time, but there is, you know, we can call it in a simplistic way a backlash, but there is a way in which this, what I would describe as a white nationalist movement toward authoritarianism um, is, is also very much tied up with patriarchal visions of reclaiming a certain kind of um, masculinity, a certain kind of political masculinity uh, that is dominating, dominating of women, dominating of the earth, dominating of workers, um, et cetera. So, um, so, so I see this moment that we're in, a kind of conjunctural crisis that we're in 
you know, as very much a part of not only a racial capitalist project, but a, but a project of, of, of patriarchy as a mechanism of legitimizing hierarchies, legitimizing domination and uh, trying to normalize oppression. So, so that's the kind of structure. Now, you know, I, I've been, I had this little quote by Gramsci that I almost carry around with me now, you know, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, and I really think we have to hold on to that because we have to have a critical engagement with this very scary, dangerous world we live in. And who knows what's going to transpire in this country in the next few years. I mean, there are growing um, racist, violent militia that are being cheered on by people with power in all kinds of ways. In some ways, the ruling elites, the capitalist elites, the billionaires in this country are divided, but that doesn't mean they're not going to get on the same page uh, at some point. Uh, and so I think we have to diagnose that problem, but we also have to have an optimism. I have an optimism about many of the young activists who are organizing who actually are feminists, they're eco-socialists, they embrace a kind of democratic, radical democratic practice, uh, which is not dogmatic, you know, as, you know, some of the oldsters have been. Um, and so I find optimism in their, in their practice. I mean, winning, we talk about in absolutes. And I think that's um, sometimes self-defeating because there are no absolute wins. But, uh, but I do think that capitalism as we know it, racial capitalism as we know it, uh, undergirded by white supremacy and heteropatriarchy cannot sustain itself as is. And it's like, even the capitalists know it, you know, they keep whining about what can we do different? How can we fix this up? It's not gonna work like this anymore. So, um, you know, I, I think we need to be more ambitious than patching it up, that we need to be, you know, envisioning a different kind of, uh, a different kind of society. And that has to be um, in the context of a global movement. So how we stitch together, you know, across the national boundaries and borders um, is something many people are talking about and making gestures toward. I mean, the World Social Forum was one gesture, gesture you know, the um, progressive and radical wing of the climate justice movement is another. There are also all kinds of transnational feminist um, networks and formations that exist. And, I, you know, there are a couple of places on the planet that I find interesting you know, the women in northern Syria, in Rojava, uh, who are fighting not for a Kurdish state anymore, but for this sort of confederalist model. Now, you know, will they be completely defeated? Is that viable? I don't know. But it is a kind of creative imaginary that I find appealing. And they're willing to fight for it. They have to fight for it. They're in the middle of a war. But, um, but that's one one, one place that's interesting. Um, you know, the Zapatistas continue with, with that experiment um, and, and, and there's others. So I don't know, we will see what happens. I'm involved in different movements here, um, a group called the Rising Majority, which is a kind of coalition of many different organizations, the Movement for Black Lives, a group called Scholars for Social Justice that's trying to, um, you know, kind of pull intellectuals and academics more into movement circles and in service to movement, um, despite despite the training to do otherwise. <laughs> so yeah, so that's a little bit of you know my my few drops in the bucket, but um, you know, optimism of the will, my friend. Very nice. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that I mean, Joy James has been. Uh, uh, quite articulate in the way she describes uh, like the possibilities and limits of what you can accomplish in the academy. And uh, maybe to close, uh, you can uh, give us a little insight into how you manage to combine those two sides of your practice, the, ac the academic side, and because you're, uh, I think you're chair of three departments. Or no, like, no, that, that I, I'm okay. sorry, that title is even out there, you know, that it's okay. just, chair is just, but, uh, right. you know, kind of, I don't know, honorific thing. It's, it, I'm right. not chair of the department. I direct something called a social justice initiative. Uh, okay. And I'm, I have a faculty appointment in um, 
uh, three departments. But, um, you know, my academic work is a job and we organize where we are. So, um, so that's what I do. I feel like I've been in the university, but not of the university. And many, in many ways, the locus of my own intellectual growth has been um, in movement spaces. And I, I, a very formative period for me was the South African struggle. And I met many people from South Africa who had not finished college but they were trying to change the world. They were trying to change that country and they had read widely. They knew about struggles in other parts of the world. They had maneuvered to get translations from you know, uh, Latin American elsewhere so that they could consume you know, kind of the lessons of, of other struggles. And so I think that's always a healthy balance. You, know, you asked about balance before in terms of biography, but in a life and in a career, um, you know, if we succumb to all of the demands, parameters, and logics of the neoliberal university, um, we're done for because it will, you know, and, and it will stifle your intellectual curiosity because it's increasingly, you know, functions like a corporation. Students are talked about like customers and clients um, and uh, big funding is, is going to places that, you know, collaborate with big business. So, um, and, you know, my friend Devarian Baldwin has just written a book um, about ways in which universities not only have ties to slavery, but also are, have been gentrifiers in communities and have played, you know, certain kind of roles in our community. So, so that's the nature of that institution. So, it, it, you know, I'm not in defense of it. I'm not owned by it. Uh, and I think that is partly what keeps me uh, focused, but you know, in a, in we're trying to be good people in an imperfect world, um, and so most people, if not all people, work for somebody that they don't agree with or some entity that is not of their making, and so I view um, the academy with a healthy dose of, of more than skepticism, but you know, real critique of the negatives and the the ways in which it often kind of captures and stifles our curiosities, ambitions, and demands a loyalty that is a betrayal of other loyalties that are, to me, more important. Yet it provides uh, uh, vital livelihoods to a whole generations of radical scholars. Uh, and it's a, it's a difficult trade-off to, uh, yeah. to negotiate. Yeah. yeah. But you know, you if you want to just interrogate, I mean, just the work of, universities too. And I think this every, every time I go in a classroom, I look at my beautiful young students and basically the university says, rank them, you know, <laughs> which are the C students and which are the A students and which ones get, you know, to go on to graduate school or get recommendations for internships or whatever. I mean, the, the idea that we contain, commodify knowledge production in this way, and then artificially rank young people with different needs, curiosity, skills, et cetera, in a reward system, you know, it, it's, it's pretty perverse, but, um, you know, we, we try to be good people in that space and do what we can to uh, operate by, you know, a more ethical set of, of, of principles. With that, uh, I want to thank you for your, uh, your hard work, your assiduous scholarship, uh, thank you for contributing this wonderful uh, biography and uh, all of your other history uh, uh, texts. Uh, thank you very much for participating in our program. Yeah, thank and you for having me. I hope we'll have a, a good uh, opportunity to have another encounter. Um, okay, let's do that. Um, That'll be it for uh, this, uh, the second event in our uh, public program for the uh, year long exhibition program, Paul Robeson, uh, artist as revolutionary from Western Hat. Thank you for joining us today and uh, we'll see you in October. And if you uh, come to Western uh, Hat in the center of The Hague in the former uh, US embassy, uh, you will be able to see the exhibition until March of next year. So please try to uh, make it over for that. <laughs>
Thank you again, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you so much and, and good luck with the rest of the program. I'll be watching as much as I can and, uh, and thanks for, for, for showcasing the work of Paul and Eslanda Robeson. Okay, I've ended the stream.